Hey everybody, Aaron Bishop here. I just wanted to let you know I have written a book. It has been published and it is available now on Amazon.com. name of the book is The Power of Passover, A Christian's Guide to the Festival of Redemption. If you want to know what Passover is about, just a really deep dive into the festival, into its history, and into why we're where we're at today. And even an instruction guide on how to hold your own Passover. It's got everything in it. So if you'd like to check that out, go to Amazon.com and search for The Power of Passover. And now we return you to your regularly scheduled program. I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we use scripture to interpret scripture through the lens of life. This week is the 11th week that we've been in Exodus, and we still have 18 weeks yet to go before we reach the end. However, this week, our Parsha is the culmination of the narrative of the Exodus. This chapter right here, chapter 14, is the chiastic center of the book of Exodus. And no wonder, this story is perhaps one of the most iconic stories in all of Scripture. Not just Scripture, but in all narratives everywhere. And perhaps the most important part of this narrative, and the one that causes it to be the most recounted story in all of Scripture, is the fact that it actually occurred in our world. This narrative is not just a cool story, it's a true story. And that's all the difference when it comes to the impact that any story can have. Now we have, because of archaeology and science, some idea of where it is that the crossing took place. There's a thin spot in the Gulf of Aqaba where the ocean floor rises from the depths to create a land bridge some hundred feet beneath the surface of the water. And this spot has been mapped and explored, and it provides a great amount of evidence for us to examine as to the accuracy of this story. We have, because of history, a time frame for the occurrence of the story. All of the evidence points to between 1500 and 1600 BC. This was a time of a sudden collapse of Egypt and of its descent into darkness for the next 150 years in Egyptian history. This is the time of the fall of Jericho and the collapse of Canaanite culture in Canaan. And there is evidence of a large part of the Egyptian population abandoning their homes and leaving all of their things behind. Now we have, because of Hollywood, an idea of what this event may have looked like. Walls of water stacked up on either side of Israel as they walk between with their carts and animals. Egypt rushing into the midst to attempt to run down and to kill Israel as they fled. Israel escaping through to the other side into freedom and the walls of water crashing back down and destroying the remainder of Egypt's military power and religion. And contrary to every Hollywood rendering of this story, Pharaoh did not live through this clash. And we have here in Scripture the only true account of the events that reveals in its telling what happened. But there's something more that is present in the text here than is apparent at first glance. You see, the revelation of who God is in the book of Exodus hasn't ended. In fact, the revelation of God's relationships to his people has only just begun. You know, it's all too easy for us as people to allow ourselves to be distracted by the grand narratives such as this, and by the majesty and the epic nature of this event, and in the midst to miss the language that's used. And in missing what language is chosen to depict the story, we can miss some of the major themes that are being explored in this story. So while we go through these chapters, I want to set aside the history of the event. I want to set aside the timing of the event in history. 
I want to set aside the visuals of the event or what it looked like. Because there's something more going on here, and something that most of us don't even recognize because we're so wrapped up in these other things. So let's look to the text that Scripture gives us and see what ideas there are in this event that can help us to expand our understanding of the revelation of God and the revelation of His people that's provided in this text. Exodus 13.21-15.18 through 15, 18. And Hashem went before them by day, in a column of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a column of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. The column of cloud did not cease by day, nor the column of fire by night before the people. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pihacharot, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Tzaphon, camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh shall say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness has closed them in, and I shall strengthen the heart of Pharaoh, and he shall pursue them. But I am to be esteemed through Pharaoh, and over all his army, and the Mitzrites shall know that I am Hashem. And they did so. And it was reported to the sovereign of Mitzrayim that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Yisrael go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took six hundred choice chariots and all the chariots of Mitzrayim with officers over all of them. And Hashem strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, the sovereign of Mitzrayim, and he pursued the children of Israel. But the children of Israel went out defiantly. And the Mitzrites pursued them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihacharot before Beelzephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and saw the Mitzrites coming up after them, and they were greatly afraid. So the children of Israel cried out to Hashem, and they said to Moshe, Did you take us away to die in the wilderness, because there are no burial sites in Mitzrayim? What is this that you have done to us, to bring us up out of Mitzrayim? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Mitzrayim, saying, Leave us alone, and let us serve the Mitzrites? For it would have been better for us to serve the Mitzrites than to die in the wilderness. And Moshe said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the deliverance of Hashem, which He does for you today. For the Mitzrites whom you see today, you are never, never to see again. Hashem does fight for you, and you keep silent. And Hashem said to Moshe, Why do you cry to me? Speak to the children of Israel, and let them go forward. And you, lift up your rod, and stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it, and let the children of Israel go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, see, I am strengthening the hearts of the Mitzrites, and they shall follow them. And I am to be esteemed through Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Mitzrites shall know that I am Hashem when I am esteemed through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the messenger of Elohim who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the column of cloud went from before them and stood behind them, and came between the camp of the Mitzrites and the camp of Israel. And it was the cloud and the darkness. And it gave light by night, and the one did not come near the other all the night. And Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea, and Hashem caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them, on their right and on their left. And the Mitzrites pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all the horses of Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to be in the morning watch that Hashem looked down upon the army of the Mitzrites through the column of fire and cloud, and he brought the army of the Mitzrites into confusion. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Mitzrites said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for Hashem fights for them against the Mitzrites. Then Hashem said to Moshe, Stretch out your hand over the sea and let the waters come back upon the Mitzrites, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its usual flow at the break of day, with the Mitzrites fleeing into it. Thus Hashem overthrew the Mitzrites in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, and the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, and not even one was left of them. And the children of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. Thus Hashem saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Mitzrites, and Israel saw the Mitzrites dead on the seashore, and Israel saw the great work which Hashem had done in Mitzrayim, and the people feared Hashem and believed Hashem and his servant Moshe. 
Then Moshe and the children of Israel sang this song to Hashem and spoke, saying, I sing to Hashem, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise him, Elohim of my father, and I exalt him. Hashem is a man of battle. Hashem is his name. He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea, and his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Hashem, has become great in power. Your right hand, O Hashem, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath, and it consumed them like stubble. And with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up. The floods stood like a wall. The depths became stiff in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil. My being is satisfied on them. I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them. You did blow with your wind, the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Hashem, among the mighty ones? Who is like you, great in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your loving commitment you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength you guided them to your holy dwelling. Peoples heard, and they trembled, anguish gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, and the mighty men of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan melted. Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone until your people pass over. O Hashem, until the people whom you have bought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Hashem, which you have made for your own dwelling, the holy place, O Hashem, which your hands have prepared. Hashem reigns forever and ever. Well, I gotta tell you, after the last few weeks of only several verses per Parsha, I was a bit disappointed to discover that this Parsha, this epic thematic center of the book of Exodus, contains so much for us to cover. I mean, there's so much to cover here that I've had to be very purposeful in choosing what to highlight. Thus, as I go through these nearly two chapters, there will likely be things that you will wish for me to cover, but I simply cannot cover them in the time allotted. Not just the time to deliver such a teaching, but the time necessary to properly contemplate every aspect of what's occurring here. You see, this chapter ties together so many different ideas from the front and the end of Scripture. It provides for us a culmination of the story of salvation as revealed in the book of Exodus. We've so far seen in the book of Exodus only the beginning of the process of salvation that occurs throughout Scripture in so many ways. Many of the things we take for granted in the New Testament find their origin here. And the revelation that is told here begins all the way back in Genesis 1, surprisingly enough. For what is the first thing that we read of in this Parsha, those last two verses of chapter 13? Hashem went before them as a cloud by day and fire by night. Immediately when we read that, we should have enter into the back of our minds the separation of day and night from Genesis 1. Now Genesis 1, 3 through 5 says, And Elohim said, Let light come to be, and light came to be. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good, and Elohim separated the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning, one day. Now, is this separation of day and night here in Exodus, is it, is it only a procedural mention? Is it a purely historical account that teaches only that this was the way that the story occurred? Or is it perhaps the key to understanding one of the many themes that's developed throughout the rest of the next chapter? Well, once we have this key, if it is such a key, it's incumbent upon us to test the key with the remainder of the story to see if it fits. Are we once again approaching a story of creation in some way? And if so, we will see this reflected in the text as we follow it. I mean, we've already seen the same topic discussed just a few chapters earlier in the story of the Exodus. The ninth plague, what was it? Egypt in darkness for three days, Israel with light for those same three days. We saw a distinction being made by God between people of darkness and people of light. Throughout the plagues, we saw Hashem revealed as the God of creation. But that revelation was one that occurred through the unraveling of creation on the people of Egypt. And it was Egypt themselves that began this process of uncreation in their midst. Oh, how, you might ask? Well, what was the last day of creation? The Shabbat. 
And what was it that Egypt did not allow for Israel? It wouldn't allow them to enter into a rest or a Shabbat of any kind, let alone a seventh-day rest. And so in this denial of rest to Israel, they began the process of uncreation. They chose to reverse the seventh day, and so as a natural fallout, the rest of what held Egypt together began to unwind. And throughout the plagues on Egypt, we saw many of the days of creation reversed. We saw the destruction of beasts and men in plague 6 and 10, which is day 6 reversed. We saw the destruction of creatures of the sea in plague 1 and perhaps 2, which is day 5 reversed. We saw the extinguishing of the heavenly lights in plague 9, which is day 4 reversed. All green things were destroyed in plague 7 and 8, which is the latter half of day 3 reversed. And so there was, in these plagues, a beginning of this reversal of creation. But the reversal was not completed. What about days 1 through 3? Is the uncreation of Egypt going to stop at day 3, or is there a greater fullness of the uncreation that's yet to come? Well, we've already been given a key to see these days, days 1 through 3 of creation, at the end of Exodus 13. The cloud by day and fire by night. Right? So do we find anything else in chapter 14 that will point us to a continuation of this line of thought, a distinction of separation occurring? Because if we really examine it, that is the underlying theme of Genesis 1, separation and distinction. So as we look for language that describes creation, we should see separation occur. And we do. The story itself points to a distinction of Israel from Egypt, a separation of peoples. Well, we've been seeing this since the beginning of Exodus and even before from the beginning of Genesis. So this theme is eminently present in the text. We can't really use that as the basis for saying that this is actually here. So let's look for other creation language throughout the remainder of chapter 14. Uh, specifically, let's look for creation language from days 1 to 3. So uh, let's go back through days 1 through 3 of creation. Oh, what was it that was created? Well, on day one, light was created, and light and dark were separated, and day and night were defined. On day two, the waters above were separated from the waters beneath, and a place was carved out between them, called the firmament, or the expanse, or whatever you want to call it, the atmosphere. Day three, the waters receded, and dry land was revealed, and vegetation grew up. Now, it only takes a moment of reflection on the story to discover that these events are present in these chapters, at least loosely. But if we take the time to examine the text closely, we discover that the author goes out of his way to ensure that these themes are present in the text. So the beginning of the story is one that we are familiar with and one that we will talk about later, especially in the book of Numbers. Israel has left Egypt. Egypt sees them vulnerable and thinks them trapped, and so after three days, Pharaoh took his greatest military might and pursued Israel to the edge of the sea. Now, when Pharaoh draws near, Israel reacts in a way that will become all too familiar with us when we get to the book of Numbers. They say, why did you take us out of Egypt to kill us out here? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? We could have died there just as easily as we're about to do here. In fact, it would have been better for us to stay in slavery than to be brought out into this wilderness and destroyed. There is in this statement something that begins a process that we'll see much later. The people of Israel accuse God of bringing them to the wilderness only to kill them. And in so stating, they actually create a self-fulfilling prophecy. They do indeed end up dying in the wilderness because they cannot trust Hashem to have their best interests in mind. Especially if that best interest means going without their comforts and only subsisting on the bare essentials. And this will come in again later, so let's hold on to that. So what is it that Moses responds to the people when they make this complaint? Well, he says, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of Hashem, which he does for you today. Hashem does fight for you, so keep silent. Now, I find these are words to take to heart. Keep silent. Do not give voice to your doubts, or you may find that God chooses to honor what you have declared. Then God speaks, and he says, 
Why do you cry out to me? Keep moving forward. He gives Moses instructions on what to do. Stretch out your hand. And then Hashem says something somewhat cryptic. In essence, he declares, I have designed this scenario so that I will be honored through Pharaoh and all the military might of Egypt. And then it's in verse 19 that we begin to see God acting. The messenger of God in the cloud moved to separate Israel from Egypt. And it's in verse 20 that we get our next indicator of the creation narrative being under discussion. Now, the language is a bit clunky, but it appears as though the cloud went and covered Egypt in darkness, and the pillar of fire gave light to Israel all night. Again, the day and night definitions described and even enhanced as these symbols of both darkness and light are placed on people who represent these ideals. Egypt being people of darkness, Israel being the people of light. Then in verse 21, Hashem causes a ruach to move over the waters, and the waters are split one from another. A ruach, the Hebrew word ruach, is one that means both wind, the movement of air from one place to another, but it's also the word that's used for spirit throughout the Hebrew scriptures from one end to the other. The word ruach, in essence, speaks of the unseeable mover, or the thing that's invisible and yet animates other things. Now, whether that's the wind that animates leaves, or in this case, large bodies of water, or the unseen mover of human and animal forms, it's all described by the word ruach in Hebrew. And in the beginning, even before the separation of day and night, it was God's ruach that hovered over the chaotic waters of creation. But it was not until day two of creation that the waters were split and a place was created between the waters. And that's what we see going on here. And then, part one of day three of creation, the waters under the heavens gathered together and dry land appears. Suddenly, in just these few verses, we discover that the creation narrative is in fact in play, but in a very interesting way. You see, the creation that's occurring here is one that can lead to two possible outcomes. One, an outcome of death for those who live in darkness. The other, an outcome of life for those who live in the light of God. And it's the same event, this single moment in time, that leads to either uncreation and destruction, or new creation and life anew. Now we saw this before in Scripture. Back in Genesis 7, as we read the flood narrative, the waters covered the earth. We read of water coming from above and below, the dry land disappearing and all living things dying, creation being reversed. Then in chapter 8, we read that the wind or the ruach began to blow, and the waters from above and the waters below stopped, and the water under the heavens were gathered into one place until dry land appeared once again. And then in that story, finally the birds were reintroduced to the earth, and then man and beast were reintroduced together. And as we went through those chapters, we reflected on this idea of new creation as the hope that we have to look forward to in our future. In the case of Noah, however, it was only eight people who were brought through the water. And in the end, the seeds of all nations were planted in the world. In the case of Israel in this chapter, the theme of new creation is revisited. And in the, this case, it was 12 tribes plus a mixed multitude that were brought forth. And in the end, we discovered that the seeds of a nation are being planted, just a single nation. Israel is being identified as a people wholly unique and unified behind their single God and with their single purpose. They are a people who are given not just their freedom, but their very identity by God. Now, if this is where it ended, we'd have plenty to think on. But this is not where the examination of this theme stops. You see, we're given another hint in the narrative that helps us to take this theme and extrapolate it then forward into future events. You see, the Passover had just occurred in the text. The people of Israel are in the midst of the festival of Matzah. And if we turn to Leviticus 23, we discover that there is one more festival day that occurs during this week. Leviticus 23, 10 through 11 and 14. Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, and it shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Hashem for your acceptance. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. 
and you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Once again, we discover something in the text similar to what we discussed last week. There is a disconnect from what has occurred before appearing in the midst of this week of Passover and Matzah. In this case, the grain that was being harvested for the new year. It's not to be eaten until the first fruits of the harvest have been offered to Hashem on this day. Now, once again, what is eaten becomes vitally important during this holy week. The first that anyone gets to eat of the new grain will be part of the festival of matzah. This shows that the very beginning, while being a new start, will be accompanied by an affliction of sorts, because that new grain it's going to be an unleavened bread. Regardless, as we proceed in Exodus from the night of Passover to the crossing of the sea, we see something profound. And go back and count it. How many stops was it from Egypt to the edge of the sea? It was three. Israel made three stops on their way out of Egypt. There was Sukkot, there was Atam, and then there was the place before pi Hacharot between Migdal and the sea. And how many days was it before Pharaoh decided to give chase? Again, it was three. Three stops, three days between the Passover and this event of new creation in the sea. Where else do we find the significant event that symbolizes new creation occurring just three days after Passover? <laughs> the crossing of the Sea of Reeds is a foretelling of the resurrection and new creation found in Messiah, in the same way that Passover is a foretelling of the death and burial of Messiah. There is, in this narrative, a profound truth for all who hope to enter into new creation and the resurrection. In this epic moment of escape from certain death and this provision of new creation that the agent of death is destroyed forever. And as verse 13 states, the Egyptians who you see today you are to never see again. Egypt has always been in this story a picture of sin and death, the ways of the world and their end. And it's in this that we see that the crossing of the Sea of Reeds is the event that the Festival of First Fruits memorializes, and that this event, similar to Passover, points to the greater revelation of redemption of Messiah Yeshua. Verse 27 points us to this truth. It says, Exodus 14, 27, And Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its usual flow at the break of day, with the Mitzrites fleeing into it. And thus Hashem overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And if we turn to the New Testament, we discover that nearly 1,500 years later, at the break of another first fruits day, another significant event occurs. John 20, verse 1 says, And on Day one of the week, Miriam from Magdala came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Luke 24, 1-3 says, But on day one of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and having entered, they did not find the body of the Master Yeshua. After three stops at the break of day, the third day from the Passover, Someone stood on the shores of new creation and witnessed the destruction of the great enemy of mankind. You see, salvation does not stop at the blood of Messiah. His death was for sure necessary for us to be forgiven of sins. But if we stop at his death, we've gained nothing. But it is his resurrection that provides the truth of the victory that he wrought on our behalf on that day. It is the resurrection that gives us the hope that the death of Messiah could not give, the hope that death has no more hold over the people of God. Death is defeated. Egypt is drowned in the sea, the agents of death under judgment and destroyed forevermore. 1 Corinthians 15, 22-26 says, For as all men die in Adam, so also all shall be made alive in Messiah, and each in his own order. Messiah the firstfruits, then those who are of Messiah at his coming. Then the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, when he has brought to nothing all rule and all authority and power, for he has to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be brought to nothing is death.
Just as the crossing of the Sea of Reeds is a prefiguring for us of the resurrection of Messiah and the new creation that was instituted upon his rising, a day that we celebrate as the Moed of first fruits, so too the resurrection of Messiah is a prefiguring, it's a proof of the new creation that awaits all who cover themselves in the blood of the Lamb. And all who are covered by the blood of the Lamb will be led to new creation. And that new creation is found in another place that this event is likened to in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4 says, For I do not wish you to be ignorant, brothers, that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed, and the rock was Messiah. The crossing of the sea is an event that is recalled in the act of baptism. The baptism is not an event of cleansing, at least not solely, but it is a transition from Egypt into Israel. It's crossing over from obedience to Pharaoh to obedience to Hashem. It's crossing over from the ruler of this world to Messiah, the ruler of the heavens. It's a declaration of Yeshua as Lord, Master, and King of your life. It's a crossing over from death into life. Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And 1 Peter 3.21, which says, Which figure now also saves us. Baptism, not a putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. Both Paul and Peter saw baptism as referring to resurrection. And so in the end of chapter 14, we read that Israel saw the great work that Hashem did in Egypt, and the people believed in Hashem and in his servant Moses. That's the phrasing used here in the Hebrew. It's not in most English translations, but that's what the Hebrew says. The people believed in Hashem. The people believed in his servant Moses. It was not a question of belief in God being a thought that agrees to the existence of God. They knew God exists, they'd just seen all the stuff that he had done. And just as belief in Moses does not mean that the people only now believed in the existence of Moses. Rather, belief in the existence or an entity of a person means nothing. Believing in someone is a belief that they are true. That the things that they have said are true. That they are trustworthy. That they have been appointed to a position that they've claimed for themselves. Hashem has done great miracles, and He caused devastating plagues in Egypt. But we're not told anywhere until now that the people believed in Him. And not since Exodus 4, when Moses did his first initial signs in the presence of Egypt, did Israel believe anyone. You see, at that time, the people put their trust in Moses. But the language that's used here seems to indicate that the people didn't quite believe in Hashem just yet. And why should they? What had they ever received from Hashem? Slavery? Hardship? Now we know that these things were not from God, but from the world, from Pharaoh. But just as we tend to do, I find it highly likely that Israel had no faith in God or what he had done for them. And so when you face some sort of hardship, you ask, why are you doing this to me, God? Now sure, there was that salvation bit back in the days of Joseph, But that sweet moment, it turned bitter in their mouths. Now they believed in Moses because he'd done signs in their midst. He was a man with power, and power was to be respected and honored. But they did not believe in Hashem. Not in the beginning. Even though they called out to him for salvation. Moses went back and spoke to Pharaoh on their behalf, in the name of Hashem, back in chapter 5. And their hardship increased. And this caused them to doubt Moses' charge and his calling. But then through the many things that had occurred, the people believed in Moses. And so when they get to the edge of the sea, they complain. They complain, we told you we didn't want to go. You, you man, you Moses, you have brought us to our deaths. Because the people did not believe in God's hand in all of this. I think that they stood on the shore after everything that had happened, that the people thought of Moses as someone grand, someone to follow, and that all that had happened was his doing and not Hashem's. 
Hashem was an afterthought to them. He was the God that Moses kept talking about, but Hashem had never done anything for them. Moses was the one who was doing it all. It's only now that Hashem had destroyed their enemies in a very real way, in an epic demonstration, that they finally and for once believed in Hashem. Not that he exists. They probably believed he exists. Not that he's powerful and capable. I think it's that for the first time, they believed that he is willing to act in a tangible and miraculous way on their behalf. That he loves them and is seeking their salvation. And that Moses, his servant, the one who speaks on God's behalf to his people, he's vindicated in their eyes only now, only once the enemy has no hope of ever claiming them again. Now it's fascinating to me that it's only after the Passover, only after the Sea of Reeds, only after an epic display of power that the people believe that God has freed them. This lack of faith in God to know what he's doing, this lack of faith in his messenger to be true. I mean, skepticism can be healthy in some cases, but it's also skepticism that can hold a person back and cause them to make brash statements and accusations. Skepticism causes us to declare, I don't understand, and so it must not be true. John 20, 24-31 tells us of a skeptic. and tells us of Thomas. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Yeshua came to them. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Master. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the marks of the nails, and put my finger into the imprints of the nails, and put my hands into his side, I shall by no means believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Yeshua came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Bring your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My master and my God. Yeshua said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. There were indeed many other signs that Yeshua did in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these have been written so that you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, believing, you might possess life in his name. Here on the edge of the sea, Israel, in their skepticism, reacted by accusing Moses of leading them into the wilderness in order to kill them. And their skepticism led them to doubt and assume the worst. It's only after their salvation that they finally believe. And once they believe and their skepticism is overcome, well, it doesn't last. We'll find out next week that their skepticism comes back, and they begin to cast aspersions once again on what God has done on their behalf. Because Israel doesn't stay in their faith. They return to skepticism very quickly. And that continued skepticism it leads to some dire consequences for them later on. Some that we'll begin to talk about next week, but that we'll really cover in the book of Numbers. Now, this chapter contains so much to talk about. The uncreation of Egypt, the new creation of Israel, the separation of Israel from the nations, freedom from slavery to the ways of the world, first fruits in the celebration of the harvest to come, resurrection and the bestowing of life on the dead, baptism and the crossing over from death into life, and that's just what I've brought out of this chapter. There's so much more that could be discussed. But for now, let's move on. Let's enter into chapter 15. This chapter is usually called the Song of the Sea, and it's a song of victory. This passage is a poetic passage, and if you've never seen this chapter in Hebrew, specifically in a Torah scroll, I recommend that you look it up. In this one chapter in the Torah, the text is split down the middle, and, and it gives us a, a visualization of the split sea. It's actually really cool. Now, because this passage is poetry, and teaching poetry is something that takes a little bit of time to really dig into the visualizations and the metaphors present, and since I'm running out of time for this episode, we're not going to spend a long time on this chapter. Now, the song contained in Exodus 15, it's a wonderful declaration of Hashem's might, power, and his chesed, his, his unfailing love, his, his mercy, his covenant loyalty. Within this song, there are several things of interest. In fact, this song points us forward to a corollary event in the book of Numbers. 
an event that is in many ways similar to the Exodus in themes, but exactly different in execution. For more than half the song, we read of God leading Israel through the sea, but in one place we read an interesting phrase. In verse 12, it says, You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. Now, in a literal way, this had not happened in this story. The earth had swallowed no one yet. The earth did not open. It did not swallow Pharaoh, who rose up against Israel to destroy them. But there is another whom this story fits, and oddly enough, the people who wrote the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston they actually included this story from number 16 in their movie. So in number 16, we read of the rebellion of Korah, and the event where a cousin of Moses and Aaron stands up against them in an attempt to lead Israel back to Egypt. In many ways, the rebellion of Korah is an event that mirrors this event here on the edge of the sea. And in that narrative, it's Korah that takes the place of Pharaoh the one seeking to lead the people back to slavery. There are a, a lot of topics that are being discussed in this chapter, uh, and there are so many that could teach us a lot. But as I said, I don't have time to pursue these lines of thought through to their end for this week. So you have some homework to do. Take some time and read the song and meditate on it throughout this week. So one other topic that I want to introduce that we'll get to soon enough in the course of our studies, but for now I really only want to touch on it slightly. It's found in Exodus 15, 16 through 17, where it says that fear and dread fell on them. By the greatness of your arm, they are as silent as stone until your people pass over. O Hashem, until the people whom you have brought pass over, you bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place of Hashem which you have made for your own dwelling, the holy place of Hashem which your hands have prepared. Now, we've talked before of how men are likened to trees in many places of Scripture. But this likening to trees is something that's a pointer to something new, something grander. So it says, you bring your people to the mountain of your inheritance and you plant them, the place that you have made for your own dwelling. This imagery is speaking of the temple or the tabernacle. And we're going to examine this type of language pretty extensively when we get to the tabernacle instructions at the end of the book. But this imagery, it's also pointing us back to the Garden of Eden plants on the holy mountain of God that was prepared by his hands in order to dwell with him. And Garden of Eden is a picture of the new creation itself, right? It's a place with the ease of life and the tree of life in its midst. And once again, new creation, but this time, new creation in the form of the temple and the fact of God dwelling with men. This topic... <laughs> Like I said, we are going to really dig into it in the latter parts of Exodus in some really fun and interesting ways. Now, there's so much more in this Parsha, and this is not the end of it. But I want to leave us with a thought that connects us to what we read last week and will propel us forward into what we're going to read in upcoming weeks. It's a passage from Isaiah that speaks of new creation in a way that uses language from this chapter in Exodus and several around it. So what was it last week? We were given indications that once being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we are to leave behind all that we knew and start from scratch. It's this leaving behind of the old that allows us to enter into the new. Well, in Isaiah 43, we read this, verses 15 through 21. I am Hashem, your Holy One, Creator of Israel, your King. Thus said Hashem, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, and the army and the power. They lie down together, they do not rise. They have been extinguished, they have been quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former events, nor consider the events of old. See, I am doing what is new. Let it now spring forth. Do you not know it? I am even making a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field honor me, the jackals and ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people my chosen, this people I have formed for myself. Let them relate my praise. Thus says the God who makes a way in the sea and destroys the horse and the chariot, which is from this week's Parsha. He's doing something new, he's disconnected from what was before, as we talked about last week. New creation is coming about, which is what we've again talked about this week. And it will be accompanied by him providing ways in the wilderness. The next two weeks we'll be talking about that bringing water to the parched land, 
drink being given to his people that he has formed. And then they will relate his praise this week. The entire episode of the Passover to the Sea of Reeds is one that can teach us so much about the new creation that is our ultimate hope for ourselves and our world and what it is that God is doing in the world. Our great hope is present from one end of Scripture to another. But every time we read of it, we discover that it is accompanied by a warning. Only those covered in the blood of the Lamb will get to participate. Only we will get the chance to enter into new creation, the new thing that God is doing in our midst. The only way to receive life in abundance is to pass through death willingly, to walk through the sea, to take on the crucifixion, to sacrifice the flesh and its desires. And in doing so, in killing the old man, a new one is created in its place. One who does not fear death. One who cannot die. One who is immortal. And this is the way of life. The path that we seek. In this one way, at least, we don't have to dare shai. We've found it. We can be clothed in life. We can receive the gift of eternal life. But it's just the first step on the path of life. Repent of your sins. Be covered in the blood of Yeshua and receive the Holy Spirit. And you will be set upon the path of life. And then you will have truly begun the process of Deresh Chai. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we Darish Chai, as we seek life. Shalom.